the pleasure of knowing Jesus. We get so blasé to that reality. Just think about that for a second. The pleasure of knowing Jesus. I, I read those scriptures and I get so numb to them because I read them a thousand times. I've become the expert on the scripture. But think about what that means. I get to know Jesus. That guy who just walked along and picked up cripples and healed people. And there was such hatred that came against him. Such persecution. He just slipped through the crowd when they wanted to kill him. That guy, I get to know him. That guy who loved us so much, he spilt his own blood. For me, I get to know him. <laughs> That's what a privilege. I get to know. I don't care if we all get killed today in a car accident. The roof falls in wilder. You know what? We get to know Jesus. <laughs> We're winners. We're winners. You can't take anything away from us because you can't take him away from us. And in that, even with that, if God didn't give us his own son, how will he not graciously give us all things along with him. He gives us our healing. We don't earn and deserve it. We don't fight for it. We don't win the healing. Because we didn't win Jesus. He won us. He wins the healing for us. We get to receive it. But we don't win healing. You don't fight sickness. Jesus fights sickness. Amen, Meiji. I'm looking at you. You don't, you don't win against sickness. He won sickness for you. That's how we prosper in our soul. That's, uh, what a revelation that you've shared with us, Heather. You, you, <laughs> that is such a powerful preach. The pleasure of knowing Him. There's power in Him and what He does for us. There's a, there's a power that goes beyond anything we can do. And we limit what God is able to do through us and to us because of our religion. Because of our conditioning, religious and cultural conditioning. And so I want to start this morning, this morning's preach, this, mo this morning has already started. But I want to start the preach by looking at a funny little video that I think is incredibly entertaining. To look at the difference between a power tool and just a tool. Go for it, John. Ти хомер? А ти се свиджа машина. А. Я знаш ти стим райт. Ага. Ай да вам покажи. This young guy is showing the Bravo. 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 Добро, добро, прегрият. Okay, stop, stop, it's going to overheat. То си сме направил за сат време, на кажеш. Да. Look how much he's chipped off Bravo. the walls. Bravo. Svaka čast. Bravo. How many look at that young guy and think, oh, he's evil, he's bad. No, he's just misinformed. He doesn't know that that's a power tool, not just a tool. And so he hasn't plugged it in. He hasn't turned the power switch on. Because if anyone doesn't, just in case you don't know, that tool vibrates back and forth at such a rate that you just hold it against the wall and it does all the work for you. But he's sweating by, <laughs> he's working by the sweat of his own brow to chip all that concrete off that wall by slamming it in. Do you know what that guy's name is? That guy's name is Christian. That's a joke. I don't know what his name is. <laughs> But that's exactly what we as Christians do. We have access to incredible power. We don't produce the power. We don't, we don't turn it on. We don't make it happen. We have access. All we have to do is plug in. Once you plug into the power, you, know not, you no longer need to slam the wall to do the work, to get the healing, to get prosperity in my soul. You need to work and you need to try and why haven't you done, 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 done? You've got to do more for Jesus. No, when you put the power on, you just stand in the right position. And in that position, God's power will do the work through you. In Luke 13, 
Jesus goes on a Sabbath day, the day of rest, and he goes into the synagogue and he's preaching and he does the unthinkable. How dare does Jesus do this? He heals somebody on the Sabbath day. Do you know, that's, they hated Jesus for that. The religious people who, were, who didn't have access to power, but they, were, they had a form of godliness, but denied his power. They were doing all the work on the outside, honoring the Sabbath. And when Jesus himself walks into church, synagogue, they hate him because he heals a lady who's been doubled over for 18 years. And he heals her. Just come on to boop. She stands up straight, instantly healed. How dare you heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus says to these people who are so, hate, so full of hatred for not just him, but also this woman. How dare she get healed on the Sabbath? It's now her fault. He says, he says a lot of things. But one of the things he says is, this is a daughter of Abraham. See, they were looking at themselves as children of Moses. Moses is our leader. Moses is our house. This is how the kingdom operates, by Moses. And Jesus wasn't operating by Moses in Moses' house. He was operating by Abraham. And when he called back to Abraham, which preceded Moses, and, and Moses didn't replace Abraham, he had a part in the picture, but he never replaced Abraham. When Jesus called back to Abraham... She was healed. And the religious world did not like it. It's a small little detail that you can easily miss. God said to me just a week and a half ago, I've never heard this from anybody, so excuse um, my clunky explanation because my brain had to now whittle it down into normal words. When you hear it from another preacher, it's much easier just to borrow it. But uh, I heard this from, directly from God. And God said to me, Sean, there are nuances in the nuances. There are new answers, new solutions in the nuances, the little subtle details that you can easily glide over and miss. He said to me, Sean, Sean start, Sean, he's called me a new name. Uh, he said, start looking for nuances because you have been limited and conditioned by religion and culture and by your own expertise over years and years and years of being the person who knows it all in your own life. But the nuances, these little insignificant seemingly details, these little subtleties will expose you to a greater dimension. And once you make these little tweaks, you will enter, enter whole new dimensions of my goodness, whole new dimensions of my prosperity. Don't just gloss over them. How many have filed their tax for the last financial year in the last couple of months? I took three days. Within three days, I've got my system so organized. I've got my spreadsheets. I've got my numbers. I'm not the person who, when you say, hey, Sean, can you get your tax ready? I'm not the one who goes, oh, what's tax? I'm not that person. Oh, what's the date? I know before that government tells me what my tax is, how to file it. I am the expert on taxes. When I came to Hong Kong, I knew nothing about taxes. I didn't know about the inland revenue. I didn't have a TIN number a tax number. I didn't know all of this stuff. I had to learn it the hard way. And I earned and I deserved my knowledge on tax. You can ask me the percentages. You can ask me the, the tax brackets. I can tell you all of the details on the tax. And within three days of them requesting, which they give you a month, I took three days. How clever am I? Oh, where's my round of applause? I'm the expert. Uh, <laughs> my brother, Seamus walks into the office a month after I'd filed my tax and said, Sean, did you file your tax? Of course I did. Don't you know the dates, Seamus? Now, Seamus is scatterbrained. He doesn't have this all. Am I right, Esther? He doesn't have all his details. He he's, flies by the seat of his pants. He figures this out on, on journey. He doesn't know what, exactly what's going on. And so I start to lecture my brother. As the older brother, I lecture the younger brother on the tax code. And he says to me, Sean, don't you know that there is a tax rebate on rent this year. It's the first time they've instituted. And I told him about all the tax rebates and the numbers. And he very politely smiled and listened to the expert who knew it all as I told him how much I knew, thinking that he had failed and he didn't know and he needed my help to fix his problem. I'm dramatizing it, but you know the heart of what I'm saying. He says, no, Sean, you're missing it. There's something new that you don't even know about because you're such an expert. 
He said, there's a new law in Hong Kong this year. So you've become such an expert over a decade that when something new was introduced, you dismissed it because you were so knowledgeable. You were so clever. And I'd filed my tax and missed out on a bunch of tax rebates on my personal home. I didn't know about the new law because I was the expert. And my clumsy, happy-go-lucky brother got the rebate that I didn't get. <laughs> it is exactly that. It's exactly grace versus law. My legalism, my knowledge, let me say this, my knowledge, my expertise made me legalistic made me judgmental, made me hard, insensitive. And because I became insensitive, I missed out on the nuance of the nuances. And the person who didn't pretend that they were the expert and didn't know it all received a greater abundance than the expert. And now I have to humble myself in front of everyone and tell you. <laughs> but that's what happens in the religious world. If you really love God... When you become religious and hard, at some point you have to publicly go, if you were public about your, your religious arrogance, you have to publicly go, I I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. Some people never repent, and they just keep on in their religion, and they know that they were wrong, and that's what Romans 1 talks about. Romans 1 talks about the hardness of heart. They had a knowledge of the truth, but they denied it. And as they denied it more and more, they got into more and more perversion. Romans 1 is the classic anti-gay scripture. And I'm not supporting gay or homosexuality. I'm just saying Romans 1 is not talking about any old people. It's talking about people who had access to knowledge. And they became arrogant about it. You wonder why the Catholic Church is full of all sorts of disgusting behavior. The church leads the world. The world doesn't lead the church. You wonder why there's pedophilia in the world? Look at the church because they had access to knowledge. And they became proud and arrogant. And then they become the experts, religious, insensitive, perverted. Anyway, Sean, you're trying to be good. You're trying to be good today. Try to be nice. There are nuances in the nuances. There are nuances in the nuances. Don't get proud and arrogant and tell yourself and tell everyone around you, know it all. You will never know it all. You will take eternity to, to still not know it all. And when you become the expert, you are setting yourself up. Not the devil. The devil's not setting you up. You are setting yourself up for a haughty spirit that then leads you to a fall. So stay humble. Stay good. God, what are you speaking to me? What's the new ones today? I don't need something big flashy. I don't need a brand new revelation. Although when he gives you new revelation, it's so wonderful. You don't need the top of the line revelation that you can then sprout off to others to pretend how clever you are. You just need his goodness. The simple John 3.16. It's one of the most hated scriptures by Christians because it's so cliche. Do you know how powerful John 3.16 is? For God so loved the world. Oh, that's me. He loves me. It should be so humbling when you read that scripture. But people are, get so blasé because they get so conditioned. They get so knowledgeable. They become the expert. I know what John 3.16 says. Well, if you truly understood what John 3.16, you'd be going, oh, Lord, John 3.16, every time you hear it. There's a humility that goes against that religious expertise. I'm not saying you shouldn't get good at stuff and help and advise others. Just don't get proud about it. Okay. <coughs> There's nuances in the nuances. Last week, we talked about righteousness. So we said that righteousness was the key to access the blessings that God has for you. Righteousness is the key. So I want to continue to talk about that. And I want to start off with the scripture we ended on last week, Romans 1. And Paul is writing here to the Romans who are wrestling through the idea of do they introduce more Judaism, more religion, more work into their Christianity? Because we believed that God saved us and that he loved us and that we couldn't do anything to earn and deserve his goodness. And then Jews came along who knew it all. And they knew the temple system, and they knew the covenants, and they knew the blood sacrifices, and they knew the, the intention of God. And so they thought, we've got a monopoly on the way to God. We know it all. And we're going to tell you, Gentiles, 
you dirty pig smelling Gentiles. We're going to tell you how you get to God. And so the Romans and many other churches are flirting with Judaism, introducing circumcision and holy days and festivals back into something that was just operating by faith. So Paul, who's the, the best of the best Jews there are, he was the top of the line. He was the pick of all the religious Jews. He was the one who was getting letters and was zealous for the law and zealous for killing Christians. He persecuted the church like no other. He's now writing them and saying, listen, guys, you've got options. But let me tell you the options that I think you should go down. As an apostle to you, I'm going to tell you what the truth is. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Everyone say gospel. 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 We're going to learn the gospel. We're going to look at some elements of the gospel today. You can't just borrow the word gospel and make it anything you want and just make it a general Christianity thing. It's very specific. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It's the power of God to bring salvation, wholeness, wellness, health, prosperity. That's the power of God to bring you good things in your soul. Not just to save you out of hell, but to keep on blessing you through this life. The, in the gospel is a power of God. Whose power? Your power? No, God's power. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Why is the gospel powerful? Why is the gospel powerful? What's the good news? Okay, good news can make me happy for a little while. It's got to be more than just good news. Just random good news. Oh, you've just had a child. Oh, you've just won the lottery. That's, that's all good news. There's something very specific about the gospel good news. Let's look at the gospel a little bit. It says, for in the gospel, this is why this is powerful. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. How do you get health, wealth, salvation, prosperity in your soul? What's the power of God? What's the power of God? It's the gospel. Why? Because righteousness is revealed. When you hear the good news about the gospel, you go, I have access to righteousness. God shows me that there's a righteousness from him that empowers me to receive all the prosperity in my soul. That's why it's good news. The gospel is not, let me show you the way to improve your life or not enough to manage your behaviors to get out of sin, to become holier and holier, to sanctify enough to the point where you qualify to get all the benefits of the cross. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not an arrow to a pathway or a system of thought that will elevate your life to a point where one day God will bless you. That's not the gospel. The gospel shows you that God did something on your behalf that you access instantaneously. How do you access that? By upgrading your life? By coming to church enough so that you can earn brownie points with Jesus? So you can get enough badges on your shoulders so that you can get a better seat in heaven? Get closer and closer to you so maybe one day you'll hear him and then you'll be good enough to get salvation. No, no, no. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God, notice this righteousness of God, not a, not a righteousness that you improve upon. God's righteousness is not imperfect and then he behaves well enough to get it. He is always righteous. He is the definition of righteous. And so for in the gospel, a righteousness of God, perfect righteousness is revealed. So that you can live up to it. No. A righteousness revealed. A righteousness that is by faith. That means you believe it. You don't earn and deserve it. You believe it. For it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Will live by faith. Some people have turned the gospel into an earn and deserve. They've just borrowed the, war, the word and put the gospel sticker on religion and said, this is how we get the blessing. We get the blessing by doing something. If you know enough of the Bible and you pray hard enough and you fuss enough, then you get right with God. That's not how you get right with God. You get right with God by 
faith. Someone say faith. Faith. I just believe that I'm righteous. The gospel is the power of God because it just shows you that that's how you get righteous, just by faith. It is as simple as taking that jackhammer and you're moving it back and forth and you're getting no result. And you just go, God just puts a, sh- a spotlight on the power switch and says, hey, there's the power. And you turn the switch on. Uh, 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 um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not getting any results. And you put the switch on because Revelation shows you that's where the power is. And you put the power switch on. Boop. And just work happens. Prosperity in your soul. You didn't earn and deserve that power. That power exists independent of you. You just put the faith switch on. I believe. Boop. So many Christians running around. And this includes me and all of us. Sometimes we are just sweating so hard to get the work done, get the work done, work done. And then we get a little bit of work done. We go, God, look at how hard I've worked. Bless me. That's not how it works. That's not the gospel. That's not the power of God. That's the power of you. And if you operate with the power of you, you're going to become more and more religious. You get less and less results. So, I heard that this week from a great preacher, he's, he's with the Lord now, uh, R.C. Sproul, 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 and a uh, beautiful man, a, a Calvinist, we don't agree with Calvin, Calvinism, but um, we can learn from anybody, and he's just such a wonderful preacher, and he, he said in his preach, he said to me, uh, <laughs> from heaven, no, he said to me, uh, the first righteous, the first act of of the gospel is found in Genesis 3. My ears pricked up. I thought, here's a new one. Never heard this before. It's a new one. It's a little tidbit. It's a little indication of the gospel. Let's look at this first outworking of the gospel. Genesis 3, what? That's the story of the snake and Eve. And how is that the outworking of the gospel? And when he, when he read this through, I was just so impacted by God's blessing that right from the get-go, the gospel was being demonstrated. It wasn't necessarily preached But it was a foreshadow of the gospel. So let's bring up Genesis 3. It starts off at the end of Genesis 2, speaking about Adam and Eve being naked, but they were not ashamed. They were not clothed physically, but there was something that made them not feel shame. We are the only animal in the animal kingdom. We're not really animals, but we're the only uh, entity in the animal kingdom that feels shame when we're naked. People just don't go running around out in the streets naked. You get a few rebellious who streak it at uh, sports shows and that sort of thing. But most of us, most of us that are sane, will cover over. But any other animal, you can look at them and they don't go, oh, don't look at me. Because God clothed them. They don't feel shame. They have fur and skin and it's not a problem for them to walk around, quote unquote, naked. But we are the only being that God created that needs to be clothed. And all the nudists said, no, no, no. Um, God clothed them in something. So they didn't feel shame. Even though physically they were naked. They were clothed in the glory of God. They were covered over with his glory. And then something happens that we blame the snake for. But he got cursed just as much as Adam and Eve did. We've got to take responsibility for what happened in the garden. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, the snake said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? There's nuances in the nuances. I've never seen this before. A couple weeks ago, I read this. I thought, the snake just said to Eve, his quote of what God said was, don't eat from any tree in the garden. I can't believe I missed that for so many years. It's not even close to what God said. God said, there's only one tree you mustn't eat from. But the snake is quoting, don't eat from any tree in the garden. That's what religion looks like. Religion takes something that's healthy. Don't touch that. That's going to burn your hand. And puts a whole pile of perimeters and boundaries and protection around it so that now you can't just touch that chair. Well, I can't touch all the chairs in the same building, is it? Oh, wait. Well, we better just be safe. Let's not touch any chairs in Hong Kong. And religion just eats more and more. It's like a cancer. It just grows and grows and grows and grows. And it just corrupts everything that it touches. It just spreads like gangrene. 
And now, we can't touch any trees. We can't touch any trees in the garden. That's what religion will do to you. And you may say, you may say a lot of things. It doesn't matter. So now the snake is misquoting God. Don't eat any tree from any tree. The woman said, <coughs> she's about to correct the snake. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So she didn't fall for this lie, but in refuting this lie, she falls for another lie. So the woman said to the serpent, uh, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Correct. Thank you, Eve. You got some truth. Well done. And here, a little nuance. And you must not touch it. God never said, don't touch the tree. He said, don't eat from it. Little nuance. When Susan, where's Su Susan? You reminded me that when the devil came to Jesus to tempt, tempt him after 40 days in the desert, the third lie was, what was the third lie? Lie, right? What was the first lie? Tell us, tell us. Yeah, because uh, God, uh, uh, when, when God opened the heaven and said, Jesus, you are my beloved son. Yes. Yeah, and the devil tempted Jesus uh, at the wilderness and said, if you are the son of God, so he actually, the devil actually is to take out the beloved, yeah. the word of beloved. Beautiful. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? When the devil quoted, you are the son of God, he had a half truth. Because God didn't call him his son. He called him his beloved son. He just omitted just a little, little twist, a little nuance. That's powerful. That's very powerful. You know, when we operate in the prophetic, be very careful to not embellish too much. You, to some extent, you have to put English or Chinese words around what God says to you. Because he speaks to your spirit. He doesn't speak to your brain uh, most of the time. And when he speaks to your spirit, your language, your vocab will catch up to what he said. And you'll filter it through your own conscience. But when you start to add too much to what he said, you're going to trip up. And you're going to start saying things that God didn't really say. Or that make sense for your current situation. But God was really talking to your next situation. And uh, I've done that. Where... God will say something to me and I'll misapply it because I'm getting clever. I'm getting intelligent and I'll make it try and fit to another situation and I'll lose the heart of what he said. Be careful. Quote God accurately. <laughs> Don't embellish. Don't omit little things that feel uncomfortable. When God speaks to you, it's for your good. So the serpent gives a little half, half lie. Eve dodges it. Then she adds in a lie of herself. Don't touch it. Or you will die. You will not certainly die. Is the, is the snake lying or telling the truth here? Well, in some sense, he is telling the truth. You won't certainly die. Because God was saying spiritually, when you eat of this fruit, you are going to die spiritually. But the, the snake knew that if they eat the fruit physically, they will not die instantaneously. You won't certainly die. And yet... You can interpret that which way, whatever way you want. This is why it's very careful when people say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Well, what Bible are you? Oh, the, the King James or the NIV or whatever version they like. You can interpret the Bible whatever way you want. Especially if you just cherry pick from this covenant and that covenant and this little scripture. You can make it say bad things. You've got to interpret the breadth of scripture and you've got to interpret it through the spirit. Not just your intellect. Because people have killed in the name of Jesus. They've killed children. Go, oh, that's what Jesus wants. Must be killed. No, Jesus came to give life, not death. But you've cherry-picked some psalm in the back end of the Bible. Or some weird story. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows, for God knows, knows. That's a word I want to focus on now. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What does religion teach you? The line between good and evil. So this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the religious tree. 
When you get into any new religion, the first thing they teach you is their list of rules and requirements. Anyone tried out any other religions? The Christian one is the worst because it's closest to the truth. And when you distort truth, what hope do you have? When you dis distort a lie, you can just draw a line under it and go, that's a lie, let me just move on. But when you distort truth, you have to unpick all of those half-truths and half-lies to get back to what the integrity of the gospel is. When the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. I love those old Chinese guys. We've got a guy in our village. He's got a nice long white beard, and I love it when he does this. He's just... <laughs> And every now and again, he'll look at me and he'll give me a little nod like, yes, Paddy One, you've got a small little beard. It's not white yet and it's only small, but I recognize you're trying. And I just feel, I feel like a little girl, like, oh, you recognize me? And he goes like this. I love it. That's what religion does. Religion says, my beard is longer than your beard. I'm better than you are. I'm wiser than you are. And we revere the guru and the priest because they're so wise. God is calling you to a personal relationship, not a relationship with a pope or a priest or a pastor, a personal relationship. Anybody who's pastoring or priesting or guruing needs to make sure that it's always leading to Jesus. Always. The second you become the expert, you're leading people to yourself. That's why... I make it a point because I, you, you know that I don't have a very high opinion of myself and what I'm doing, but I will always make it a point to somehow communicate some fault or some bad thinking or some mistake because if you trust me, you're in trouble. You need to trust Jesus and only Jesus. Now, as brothers and sisters, we can help and coach, encourage. Don't forget the gathering of the saints. There's good godly leadership, but the guru at the front is not better than you. And that guru at the front better lead you to Jesus and no one else. People get so, I've said this a couple of weeks ago, people get so bent out of shape because their guru, I can think very clearly of Todd Bentley. Todd Bentley, he fell into sin or whatever they, language they use. Um, people now no longer want to go to church because Todd Bentley, some guy they don't know personally, they don't have a relationship, but they hung on every word he said and not on every word that Jesus said. And I really enjoyed Todd Bentley's ministry to some degree. Some things were a bit weird, but I'm okay with weird. Look at me. Look at you. <laughs> but my life didn't fall apart because Todd Bentley did something bad. Ravi Zacharias, I really loved his ministry. I really benefited from Ravi Zacharias. You know, the whole time that I was ministered to by Ravi, he was doing bad things with women. He was doing a Bill Cosby. How do you work that out? I was blessed. I don't know if you've heard of his ministry. He was an apologist. The one thing he said was, you know, apologetics, which is learning it. It's like the study of theology. He said, apologetics is just the salt. It's the flavoring on the turkey. Jesus is the turkey. The second he said that, he won my, he won my, my respect because I thought, yeah, he's put all of this other weird stuff in context. Jesus is the main meal. This is just flavoring. At the same time he was saying that, he was doing bad things with women. You know what? I didn't lose one night of sleep over Ravi Zacharias when it came out after he died that he did some bad things. Do you know why? Because my life is not based on Ravi Zacharias. I was blessed by some of his ministry on my journey to worship Jesus. I wasn't worshiping Ravi. I wasn't worshiping Todd Bentley. I love Rob Rufus. Practically family. But I don't worship Rob Rufus. I love his ministry. I am a, a product in this church of his ministry. But if, and Rob has never done this, and I doubt he will ever do this. But if Rob ever did something stupid, do you know my life would not fall apart? Why? Because I'm so strong and I'm so healthy and I know, no, not, nothing to do with me. Because I don't worship Rob Rufus, I worship Jesus. And you should be exactly the same. It's good to learn from great preachers and great ministers. It's good to have friends who can prophesy and read dreams and do all of those stuff. It's beautiful. But worship Jesus only. Don't worship people. 
I know for some of us that sounds trivial. But the next time one of your so-called heroes does something bad, even if it's a small little thing, watch yourself and say, am I reacting like my world's fall apart? Maybe I've built a foundation in the wrong place. Anyway, then Eve took some and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So he was just as guilty as her, and perhaps he was more guilty. Hey, don't aim him too loudly. <laughs> Watch this. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The glory of God had lifted. They lost out on God covering them, and their eyes opened. Now they became knowledgeable. They knew something now. It's amazing how confident some people are in doing certain things without knowing the dangers of those things. And then when they figure out, oh, there were crocodiles on that river that I swam across. I was just swimming the best that I could. And as people started to com compliment me for how brave I was, I'm like, oh, I'm not brave. I'm just swimming. Everyone knows how to swim. No, there were crocodiles. <gasps> and they start getting fearful. When you don't know something, you can actually produce at a much higher level than if you knew all of the pitfalls. <laughs> if you knew how difficult marriage was, you wouldn't get married. Or very few of us would. Marriage is terrible. And so I always lick my lips when young people want to get married because I think, oh, you're about to enter into hell. You can join us in. You know I'm joking. You know, marriage is God's idea. Please, I'm just joking. Some things you enter into, a lack of knowledge is a healthy thing. The more you know, it doesn't always help. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. I'm not preaching ignorance. I'm talking about the right type of knowledge. We'll get there in a second. The, the, the Christians that I've seen so most mixed up in life are the Christians that know it all. They know all the caveats. They know all the scriptures. They have all the experience. They get paralyzed by how much they analyze because they've got all this data. Sometimes you need one piece of data. Jesus says, go, you go. I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know how it's going to work. And you're just obedient to that one piece of data. But when you've got 1,500 pieces of data, you then become like a computer and you're trying to calculate odds and risk and should I or shouldn't I? And he said in this word, and please give me another prophecy so I can make a decision. Sometimes it's just better to just do what God said. People think that if you're obedient to God, you're like a robot. No, you're like a robot when you have all this data. You're listening to 1,500 different things. And then you get burdened with information. Just be obedient. That's the most freeing thing. So the eyes of both of them were then open. They realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Fig leaves are organic matter. Now, how many know that there's a Jewish festival called Yom Kippur? Please don't quote me on every single detail in this because I haven't researched this for a couple of years. So I'm doing this by memory. But I believe Yom Kippur is the one where they build those booths. Is that right? I'm getting a nod. I'm getting a shake. Do I hear a... Can you give me more data? Anyway, there's a Jewish festival where they build these booths out of organic matter. Part of the law is they have to build it out of palm trees and things that will decay. And on the first day, they sacrifice something like 13 bulls. The second day, they sacrifice 12 and 11 and 10. And if you add up all those numbers, it comes to 70. 70 being the number of the nations. And so this feast shows something to do with the nations that under a legalistic mindset, as you approach God, as you do something for God, you build these booths, the numbers decrease. There's a fading glory. Not only do the numbers of bulls decrease, because the sacrifices get less and less significant, but also the organic matter starts to decay. Can you imagine being in one of those booths that you have to sit in all day, and by day six and day seven, everything's falling apart? Now look at this. What did they sew together for themselves? Fig leaves. Something that is not a lasting covering. It's not clothes. It's not fashionable. Things will start poking out after a little while. I'm being naughty. There is a decay in man's attempt to cover himself. There is a fading glory in what you can do. So now their eyes are open to their nakedness. And their attempt 
is pathetic. When you try and cover yourself, there is a fading glory. Look at the effect of this. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The day before when they heard that sound, they ran to him. They were excited. Their faces were happy. They were going, God, look at what we did today. Look at the animals we named. Look at what we planted and what we grew in that food that we picked. Ah, oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much for the pleasure that you gave us in the garden. We tried a new fruit. This day, their nakedness Became, they became conscious of their nakedness, and now they've got fig leaves on, and they are not confident before God in their own self-righteousness. Because as he comes running, they don't get afraid of God. I always read that like they're afraid of God. They're not afraid of God. It says, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Why were Adam and Eve lake naked? Uh, why were they afraid? Because they were naked. Even though they had fig leaves on, they knew it was not an ad ad adequate covering. Can you see that? They weren't afraid of God. They were afraid of God seeing their nakedness. When you come into the presence of God and, the, and there's just a glory and an atmosphere, when you understand that He loves you, because he chose to love you, you don't mind being naked. You're not afraid because you know he's clothed you with righteousness. He's clothed you with his goodness. And you come in and you lift your hand to confidence and say, God, I love you. When you don't understand righteousness, when you feel the presence of God, you will leave the church building. You will leave the room. You will feel uncomfortable because you know something is being uncovered. I used to hate it when I was a young, very young Christian. I used to hate it when the prophet would come into town because I knew the prophet could see what God could see and would articulate what the prophet would say, what God would say. And I would hate it when a prophet would walk up and down an aisle because I thought, if they pick me, they're going to see my sin. I knew I wasn't covered. And all of my best efforts to cover myself, I knew were not adequate. So I hated the prophet coming in. Now, I love the prophet. Why? Because now you have no sin? No, I have just as much sin, maybe more sin. I've been around for much longer. But now I know that I'm not covered by what I do. I'm covered by what Jesus did. So now I invite prophecy because I love people prophesying. Because it's not about me and my inadequacy. It's all about him and his adequacy, what he covered me with. Can you see that? If you feel afraid to come into the presence of God, it's not a problem with your morality. Because your, your morality is not a problem with God. It's a problem with you understanding that your righteousness doesn't come from fig leaves. It comes from what he did. If you feel nervous about something trying to prophesy of you, it's not the prophet's problem. It's not God's problem. You are afraid that you haven't got adequate righteousness. I know a lot of people in this room, if not all, know what I'm saying. But when you get someone else who's nervous, the biggest fear about the Holy Spirit in meetings is they're worried that something's going to come out. So they try and cover themselves, protect themselves. Counsel people. The Holy Spirit loves you. He's good. He won't call out all your sin. He doesn't have enough time in the meeting. He, but he loves you anyway. Next slide. Who told you we're naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to not eat from? Have you eaten from religion? Once you start eating of religion, your eyes become open. You see your inadequacies. Next slide. And he said, oh. And he said, who told you? Uh, verse, that doesn't matter. I didn't give it to you. Verse 21, 22. It says, then God made skins or, or, or coverings of skin for Adam and Eve. That is the first outworking of the gospel in the Bible. Genesis 3, 21. Because God took away the inadequacy of their own attempt at fig leaf fading religion. And he did something on their behalf to cover over their immorality. If you look at the mercy seat in the temple system, it sits above the law. And where does the blood go? It goes on the mercy seat to cover over what we've done wrong. Everything 
in what God has done. Love covers a multitude of sins. God doesn't uncover your sin. That's not his intention. His intention is to cover over your sin. Because he knows that if you're left to your own devices, you will try and cover with religion, which is what most Christians do, and that is a fading glory. And then when you do that, you will hide from him. And he loves you so much, he wants to encounter you. He wants to walk with you. So the way to walk with God is not to use religious effort and your own power to cover over yourself. It's to receive his righteousness. Can someone say amen? Philippians 3. Paul is writing to the Philippians now. We read this a few weeks ago. And he's talking about all the reasons and all his uh, CV, all his expertise that he had under the old covenant. And he said, for I myself have such reasons, uh, have reasons for such confidence. If someone else, some of those other Jewish guys that think they're so cool, look at me. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. I was so zealous. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. What was Paul dressed in? Clothes that God made or fig leaves that he made for himself? Fig leaves. He was eating from the, knowledge of, uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had all of the lines down. He had built a system and he had perfected that system and he was faultless in it. And then he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Every religious paraphernalia, everything that I idolized about how hard I worked, that was all a negative on my bank balance. He said, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil will make you know a list of rules and a list of failures. And sometimes, on the occasion, a list of successes. But when you disregard that and push that to one side and say, I'm not going to live by a fig leaf religion. I now know Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. Now this is not a commiserate, like, oh, I feel bad for me. I've lost all things. All I've got that's left is Jesus. No, he gladly gave everything over because he wanted to know Jesus. Because that it was greater value to him. Now watch this. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Now, I always thought in this scripture that garbage, lups up, was a bad thing because it was stinky and dirty and smelly. And the original word there is not just throw away rubbish. The original word there is menstrual rags. And I always thought it was weird that Paul would say, well, this is the most disgusting thing there is, menstrual rags, because it's a natural process. And th just this week, I heard a preacher say, it's not because it's so bad. It's because when a woman has her monthly cycles, if she doesn't produce... She has her period. And so when Paul's looking at this context, he's saying, everything I try to produce by the law, everything I tried, didn't end up in labor. It didn't end up in fruit. I just threw it away. But when I know Christ, figuratively, I get pregnant. And the cycle, the natural cycle stops. And I don't have any more menstrual rags because now I'm pregnant. There's fruit coming out of my life. Very, I've never heard that before, right? And nuances and the nuances. Sometimes people read the scripture and they go, I must give away everything so that I can know Jesus. And they become religious about it. You don't need to do that. You just need to understand from the context of this is that when you try by your own effort, it produces nothing. It's a fading glory. But when you just say, okay, I just want to know Jesus. And we'll look at that in a second. I just want to operate by righteousness. Clothed in his glory, not in what I can do. Now I start to produce. 
Is that the last, John, for Philippians 3? And I want to be found in him. Watch this. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. When you have a legalistic thing, you can tick all the boxes and you can put fig leaves on and now you're righteous. He's saying that doesn't produce anything. He says, but that which is through faith in Christ. Everyone say faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God based on faith. That's the gospel. That there's a righteousness from God that you just believe. That's Romans 1. That's Genesis 3. Philippians 3. We're going to read one more scripture. Let's bring up. Yeah, Romans 10. We get so impressed by intention, by work ethic, by how, how hard people try. And I think sometimes that is just deserved. When someone tries really, 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 really hard, we've got to give them credit and say, well done, that's, that's good, you tried very hard. But when it comes to righteousness, the harder you try, the less you produce. You can get your sewing needles out and you can sew the best garments made out of fig leaves and you can make it elaborate and you can put all the patterns together and spend hours making all of this thing work but within a few days it's going to decay and so is that a good thing or a bad thing is all that intention all of that passion all of that zeal all of that internal pressure all of that knowledge to get better at making a covering for yourself is that a good thing or a bad thing it's a terrible thing because it produces nothing. <laughs> Let me apply it personally. If you're walking around life going, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. Bless what I do. Bless the work of my hands. See, bless where I go. Would you bless this meeting? I've got this medical report. God bless me. Would you show me your kindness? Would you show me your favor? In this situation if you're walking around praying those sort of prayers I can see people looking at me like I pray those prayers I pray those prayers too but there's nuances and the nuances if you walk around praying those prayers you've missed righteousness because righteousness is the key to the blessing and if you see your covering as something God did then God's work is perfect and he's already covered you so if you start to pray prayers that, God, please cover me, you've missed what he's already done for you. And so your prayer is a place of debt. You're praying, you're praying from a place of debt. You're saying, God, what you have done in my life is not adequate yet. So my prayer is going to unlock the blessing. If I don't pray the prayer of blessing, then I won't be blessed is what you're saying. Can you see that? So now when the blessing does come, the doctor's report comes positive, or the job promotion, or the girlfriend says yes to the marriage proposal, or you get a pay rise, or you get your healing, or whatever it is, now the result is dependent on what you said, what you prayed, how you positioned yourself. And it's not dependent on the power of God, which is a revealed righteousness. Can you see that subtlety? It doesn't seem like it's a big thing. It seems like it's really positive to go, God bless me, God bless me, God bless you. Oh, isn't that zealous? Isn't that wonderful? But that puts the pressure on you praying that prayer. Now, don't condemn yourself if you pray those prayers. I pray those prayers all the time. Theologically, you've got to understand that there are ceilings on that sort of prayer life. There are limitations. There's a threshold that you cannot pass with and understanding that ignores righteousness. Because this is a better prayer. Thank you, Father, that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you that you have already blessed me. And because you have already blessed, blessed me, independent of what I pray, thank you that I am already blessed. Because I am blessed, show me what meeting to go to, what meeting not to go to. Show me whether should I go to the doctor or not. Should I take this treatment or not? 
Don't ask God. Don't make plans and then God ask God to. English good me speak. Don't make plans and ask God to bless them. Understand God has already blessed you. And ask him what plans to make. Because in the blessing, God will direct your footsteps. Some people don't want to ask God what plans to make. Because uh, number one, they don't believe that they're blessed. So they have to beg for the blessing first. Or number two, they're rebellious. And they think that they're independent of what he does. And I'm just blessed already and I don't have to ask. No, no you don't be rebellious. You're in a partnership by faith. And so you understand, number one, I am blessed. I am the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. If the Father blessed the Son, then I'm just as blessed as Jesus. Jesus said himself in John 14. He said, the miracles I do, you can do also. And even greater. Why is that? Why is that? Because you're going to get a more amount of knowledge and you've got more time on the earth than 33 years so you can accumulate wisdom? No. Because you're just as righteous as he is. And because you're just as righteous as he is, you can see what he could see. Because you're seen just like he's seen. So do not make a prayer to be blessed. You are already blessed. Thank God for his blessing and say, God, what plans do I make in your blessing? And no matter how zealous and how passionate and how well-intentioned your prayer is, if you don't see that righteousness is the key first, you have a limited access. Righteousness is the key. Let's look at this. Paul's talking about the Jews here, and he's saying, for I can testify that they are zealous for good. Good, zealous, they're really trying their best. He's saying, but their zeal was not based on knowledge. You see, Sean, you've got to have knowledge. You've got to have knowledge. Well, that's what Eve was thinking in the garden too. She also wanted knowledge. She saw it was desirable for gaining wisdom. <coughs> she saw the formula. She thought, let me cut and paste the formula and I'll apply it to my life. And uh, then God will bless me. When you prayed for your healing, what direction were you standing in? Because if I stand in the same direction, you, who prayed for you? Because I want them to pray for me too. Because I've got a beard. I had a, uh, there was a man who came to visit somebody else in this building. And they saw me with a beard and they said, I want that man to pray for me. Because he's got a beard like Aaron. And there's a blessing on Aaron's beard. So he came to me because I looked Jewish. And he wanted me to pray for him. And I, I, my mouth just dropped. I was like, I, I can't believe this is happening. Doesn't he know that I'm blessed not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did for me? So I'm going to pray for him, and he's going to receive a blessing. But it's got nothing to do with a beard or not a beard. And I tried to explain this to him, and then he lectured me for half an hour on Israel and the Jewish blessing and all of this stuff and how zealous the Jews are. And I thought, the righteous will live by faith, not by their Jewishness or their Gentileness or by their prayer or not prayer or by the tithe or not prayer. They live by faith. I'm blessed because I believe I'm blessed. Not because of my beard. Not because of the way I position myself in that prayer. Not because of the food I ate or didn't eat. Their zeal was not based on knowledge. Let, let's qualify this knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God but sought to establish their own. They sewed fig leaves together themselves rather than trusting in God's righteousness. And you know, when you try and establish your own righteousness, you've got to get court documents together. You've got to put your, your records together. You've got to get your whole legal team on side. You've got to prepare your testimonies. You've got to put a public persona out there. You've got to get a PR team together because look how righteous we are. And you've got to make sure any mistakes that you make are not public. It's just internal. And you've got to try and expunge all the old records so that I can be righteous. That's how you establish your own righteousness. Someone says to you, how are you doing? You go, I am blessed in Jesus' name. Even though you're coughing. And you're feeling sick. And the report isn't that great. And actually this week you contemplated killing yourself. I'm blessed in Jesus' name. That's an external righteousness. It's not submitting to God's righteousness. It's proving your own case. It's working your own abilities. Presenting your own abilities. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Now watch this. Christ is the culmination. In other versions it says, Christ is the end 
of the law so, they may, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The law is a system that tells you what perfect righteousness looks like. When you come to know Christ, Philippians 3, you end all of that stuff that can't produce anything that's a decaying glory so that you can just simply know him. And when you know him, there's a faith that receives your life. For the righteous will live by faith. Ask God for revelation on righteousness. Don't ask God for the solution to the little problem that you have. Ask God to show you by revelation the righteousness that you already have. And when you see that righteousness, the solution will present itself. We're so busy pestering God like that little old lady who needs the judge. We're knocking, 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 knocking. And, and Jesus is saying something good about who the Father is and how, how good of a judge he is. But he's using a bad example. He's using the worst example he can think of when he uses that example. We are not the little old lady that knocks on the door that eventually if we knock enough, God will listen to us. We're not that. We are beloved. If he knows the little sparrow that falls from the ground, falls from the air to the ground, and he knows the hair on your head. Does he not know what you need before you even ask it? Has he not already made a way to bless you before the words leave your mouth? And we think we'll be heard. Jesus said, don't pray like the pagans who think they'll be heard for their many words. God doesn't respond to how well you pray, how, articu how well you articulate the problem. God doesn't even respond to your faith. God doesn't need your faith to respond. He's already responded at the cross. Your faith accesses what he's already done. If you think your faith moved God, then it's about you and your faith. You don't move God. He's already moved. He's already blessed you. You position yourself to say, thank you, God, that you have already blessed me. What plans do I make in the blessing? People are going very quiet. I'm trying to discern why are they quiet. Am I not articulating it well enough? Or are you thinking about it? God loves you. God, <laughs> God really, 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 really loves you. He really loves you. God loves you so much, he didn't leave your spiritual journey up to you. He didn't trust you to go to the cross. That's how much he loved you. He loves you. Just lift your hand and say, thank you, Father, that you love me. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you've already blessed me. Lord, I repent where I've tried to impress you by how well I pray or how much I give or what I do. Where I've tried to impress you with my faith. Thank you, Father, that I can simply receive because I know that you love me. Lord, in areas that I have tried to cover myself and present myself in a certain light, put the best figs on, fig leaves that I can on, I just repent of that and I say, I want to be clothed by you. Lord, dress me, dress me. You dress me by your righteousness. Thank you, I do not approach by what I do. Thank you, Father, that you approached me by what your son did. Thank you. Just say, Father, I allow... <laughs> this is so, it sounds almost her heretical to say what I'm about to say. But take the heart of it. I, technically, I'm probably wrong on this. But just take the heart of what I'm saying. Just say, Father, I allow you to approach me. When, when the Father came to walk in the cool of the evening, they hid. Just say, Father, approach and give me the opportunity not to hide. Let me just stand here. One of the most common messages in the Bible, when an angel or Jesus or God presented himself to a human being, one of the most common messages was, do not fear. Because people would just fall on their faces as though dead. And we are so conditioned to be 
afraid of our nakedness. And God has made a way to clothe you already. So don't try and fight the fear. Try and understand he's already dressed you. He has dressed you in his righteousness. He has prepared you for the wedding feast. You don't prepare yourself. Thank you, Father, that you've dressed me. Thank you that you've dressed me. Holy Spirit, I just invite you now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like some people have been walking through a maze. And all they see is green hedges all around them. Every time they take a turning, they find a dead end. So they try and retrace their, pay, their steps and they're trying to stay calm and they're trying to stay in peace, but they're working hard to try and make it through the maze. And there's moments of excitement, but most of the time it's, it's a disappointment because every turn we take, we're finding another dead end. And I feel like God is elevating us to new dimensions to make us zoom out, to help us to zoom out from that individual walk to looking from, from high up, looking at the maze so that even a three-year-old could just trace their journey through to the prize. When you look at things from the bird's eye perspective, from the heavenly realms, from a place of being clothed in his righteousness, the solution is easy. But when you're in the trenches, when you're in the moment, and you're not operating from his righteousness, but your own righteousness, it just feels like it's a dead end after a dead end, doldrums, going nowhere, producing nothing. So God's saying, come up to a new dimension. Come up to me clothing you. You stop trying to clothe yourself. Come up to me clothing you. Thank you. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. God's saying, put down the knitting needles. You're working so hard to impress me. You're really trying with good intention. You're just zealous. You're passionate. You're trying to do the right thing. And I commend you for that. But I want you to put down the knitting needles because I've already... I've already sewn something without human hands. I've already dressed you. In righteousness, what are you doing? Wasting your time, producing nothing, trying to impress me. As subtle as this sounds, I, I feel like some people in this room have been praying prayers, hoping they're good enough, that they sound good enough. God's not, he's not waiting to be impressed by your prayer. The antidote to that is not trying to not pray clever prayers. It's seeing that he's already clothed you. He's already dressed you. He already calls you righteous. You are righteous in his eyes. Don't allow Moses to condition you, condition your concept, condition the way that you interact with God. Moses is there to make you feel separate and to expose you as needing someone else's righteousness. So don't be conditioned by Moses. Understand that the righteous will live by faith. God is calling you to a life of abundance, a life of passion, a life of freedom, a life of just um, exuberant miracles and manifestations of his goodness in all dimensions. Don't limit God by you getting your knitting needles out and showing him what you can do. Allow God to demonstrate his goodness to you and through you by what he can produce. And you just respond in faith. You respond in faith and say, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you that you made me righteous. The next time you feel that performance pressure, you feel that condemnation, just say, thank you, Jesus, that the performance pressure was on you and you performed perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. 
Learn to answer those accusations from the devil. He's the accuser. He accuses you. God, doesn't, God will never accuse you. And so when the accusation comes, learn to answer it. Not with half truths, with full truths. The full truth is, I don't need to eat the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't need to touch it. I need to eat it. I don't need to look at it. I don't need that wisdom. I already have godly wisdom in Jesus. Don't play the game. Just say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am clothed in his righteousness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Can we all just lift our hands towards Meiji and just pray for Meiji? Meiji, I just, I, I, you know we've been praying for you every day. But I just feel God's favor on you. And as a family, this is, God's favor is already on you. But I just want to agree with God's favor. Just, just sit there and just, just receive. Say, Father, we thank you for your love for Meiji. We thank that you've allowed us to love her too. We love her so much. We thank you, Father, that you have blessed her, that you have covered her in your blood. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we do not pray for healing because we know you've already healed Meiji. But we agree with the divine healing you've already provided for her. Thank you for every cell, every molecule in her body to be vibrating with your healing presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We command that healing. We command that healing that's already been won. Meiji, you are not to fight. You are not to fight because you are more than a conqueror. You are not to fight. You are not to fight. You are more than a conqueror. You are a princess in his kingdom. He's not sending you out to battle. <laughs> you are not a warrior princess. You are a princess on a throne. And he is serving you. I see Jesus washing your feet, Meiji. I see Jesus washing your feet. And he's saying, it's not your time to wash other people's feet now. You will do that. He's saying, it's not your time to serve others. He is serving you. And that's why we're all praying for you right now. Is we are serving you. I can see him washing your feet. He loves you. He loves you. Wow. Don't fight. You don't fight. You have fought. And there's been the right time for you to fight. But God is saying, it's not the time to fight now. You're a princess. He is serving you. He's loving you. And there's doctor's reports that are up and down and up and down. But there's a heavenly report that's never gone down. And he's saying, you rest in the favor he's already given you. Rest in that. You can't pray for more favor. He's already favored you far beyond you ever deserved. That you could ever deserve. He's already favored you. As a family, we agree. We stand with you. No, we don't stand with you. We sit with you. <laughs> in his rest in his rest he, he loves you so much and Meiji we love you we love you so much and Kevin he loves you more than us <laughs> City Church God really loves us just say, say this because it's easy to hear somebody at the front that you don't know very well to say God loves you and you go yeah 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 nice. I want you to say this to yourself God loves me God loves me. The truth is you don't really believe that. That's the truth. Sometimes you believe it. Sometimes you don't. But confront yourself with that truth every day. And go, God, God, really? Really? You love me? Really? You love me? After you've just failed. After you've got the bad doctor's report. After you've got the bad test on the score. After you've just sinned. Go, God, you love me. You, God, you love me. God, you, lo you love me? You love me? Never forget that. Never forget that. When you understand that key, that you are righteous, the whole world opens up to you. All that prosperity that Heather was preaching on, all that opens up to you. Because you will prosper even as your soul prospers. And if you tell yourself lies that God doesn't love you, or that your sin has somehow exposed you to the devil, or any of that nonsense, then you've got to start agreeing with religious lies. 
And if you start finding yourself trying to prove your case before God, you know you've fallen from grace and you've started to play with fig leaves. So, Father, I take away those fig leaves. Thank you that you have sowed a covering for me. Thank you that you have covered it. It's the only righteousness that's good enough. It's his righteousness. Bless you, City Church. Have a fantastic afternoon. We'll see you next week.